friends, I'm Dr. Shonali and I'm back with another clinical situation from our labor rooms, which is shoulder dystocia. And that is what I will be discussing with you today. So what exactly is shoulder dystocia? Dystocia means difficulty in delivery and shoulder dystocia means difficulty in delivery of the shoulders. So as we can see uh, from the figure on the right here, the head has delivered, but the anterior shoulder is stuck behind the symphysis pubis. And that is why it doesn't come down and deliver. Sometimes the posterior shoulder can also get stuck behind the sacral promontory here, but that is uh, less common. What is more common is uh, the anterior shoulder getting stuck. So that is about the definition of shoulder dystocia. Let us elaborate on the situation by using a clinical scenario and we will see what kind of questions are asked and how do we make the diagnosis and how do we proceed once the diagnosis is made. So there's a 33 year old Gravida 7 para 6 or grand multi paris at 39 weeks gestation undergoes induction of labor for gestational hypertension. A previous pregnancy is ended in uncomplicated vaginal delivery. So there's nothing very significant in the past uh, history here. She has a history of fibroids in the lower uterine segment. Her BP is 160 by 96. Pre-pregnancy weight was 115 kgs and on top of that she has gained 13.6 kgs during this pregnancy. So she is obese. Fundal height is 43 centimeters. 22 hours after labor induction, so that is considerably long. And after two hours of pushing, again, a longer duration of the second stage, the fetal head delivers and retracts onto the maternal perineum. Gentle traction fails to deliver the anterior shoulder. What they're asking is which of the following is the greatest risk factor for this condition. Now, this condition that we're talking about is shoulder dystocia. When you talk about the risk factors, what about gestational age? So yes, post post maturity is a risk factor but in this particular case the woman is 39 weeks so gestational age here is not a risk factor hypertension now, hypertension does not contribute to shoulder dystocia if there's a medical con condition that contributes and that is maternal diabetes be type 2 type 1 diabetes or gestational diabetes mellitus all right that is associated with macrosomia a fetus weighing more than 4 kgs and on top of that uh, you know diabetes and gestational diabetes they're also associated with increased shoulder girth because there's a lot of fat deposition around the shoulders in uh, babies with mothers who are having diabetes so gestational diabetes or diabetes mellitus is a risk factor not hypertension what about uterine fibroids now fibroids in the lower uterine segment can definitely interfere with the normal progress of delivery can cause dystocia right but they are not going to selectively cause delivery difficulty in delivery of the shoulders in this particular case the head is already delivered so i can assume that the fibroids are not interfering with the process of delivery all right so that is why fibroids is also ruled out in this particular clinical situation however maternal obesity yes is a direct and very important risk factor for uh, shoulder dystocia which we can see from the clinical situation here so that is our answer there are other risk factors also so let us just uh, go through that list of risk factors which are associated with shoulder dystocia. We have fetal macrosomia, like I described, maternal diabetes, maternal obesity, prolonged labor, especially prolonged second stage, instrumental delivery, induced labor, post-maturity, prior history of shoulder dystocia, multiparities. These are the risk factors associated with shoulder dystocia. But it is important to remember that about 50% cases of shoulder dystocia will have no identifiable risk factors at all, making shoulder dystocia a very unpredictable event so it can happen to any woman in the labor room okay now how is the diagnosis of shoulder dystocia made now the diagnosis is very clinical and self-evident like the language described in the question that normal routine traction axial traction on the neck fails to deliver the shoulders however there is a sign that is described for the diagnosis and that is called as the turtle sign so just like the uh, head of the turtle comes out of its shell look at this figure here and try to superimpose this image on the right side so look at this the fetus's head delivers but retracts back onto the perineum so it is 
by retracting back means the fetus's head is pulled back onto the perineum tightly right so giving this uh, appearance of a turtle's uh, head that is why called as a turtle sign all right so sometimes the head is so tightly pulled back onto the perineum that even it even fails uh, to undergo restitution getting stuck in this uh, position so that is called as the turtle sign now once the diagnosis of shoulder dystocia has been made we have to act very quickly all right it is an emergency and why is that because obviously once the head is out and it is taking longer than normal to deliver the uh, rest of the baby it is the umbilical cord which gets compressed you know between the fetus's chest and the fetus's abdomen and the birth canal right so that is going to compromise the um, blood supply to the fetus and going to cause hypoxia to the fetus okay so the emergency has to be remembered and we have to know how do we proceed under such circumstance so the first thing that we need to do is cry out for help we need to mobilize help we need assistance we need to inform the pediatrician the anesthetist the senior obstetrician on call and any help at hand has to be mobilized the second thing we have to remember is do not push from the fundus if we push from the fundus it is going to create more problems it is going to not relieve the uh, shoulder from behind the symphysis pubis rather it is going to cause more and more hinging of the uh, shoulder behind the symphysis pubis so do not push from the fundus do not pull down from below imagine if you are going to pull down the baby's neck like this in this particular direction because there's a tendency in this situation what uh, obstetricians uh, or what uh, junior residents who are less trained in the particular in this clinical scenario there's a tendency to you know just hold on to the neck and keep pulling down keep pulling down and with more than the routine traction if that is done what is going to happen is going to cause unnecessary pull or traction on the fetus's neck so then the fetus's neck is going to be pulled like this the brachial plexus which traverses through the neck can be pulled right and cause brachial plexus injury so we don't want that so that is why no pushing from the fundus and no pulling from below no undue pulling from below make the woman lie flat buttock should be brought on to the edge of the bed drain the bladder consider an episiotomy now i say consider an episiotomy because episiotomy by itself is not going to relieve the dystocia see the dystocia is happening at the level of pubic symphysis we are giving episiotomy at the level of the perineum so episiotomy by itself does not rule the uh, does not correct the dystocia relieve the dystocia what it does is gives us more space to do uh, maneuvers which are required to deliver the shoulders on top of that what is done is apply supra pubic pressure now if you are standing and delivering the woman you cannot apply the supra pubic pressure some assistant has to come and apply the supra pubic pressure and immediately you flex the thighs to the abdomen if the woman is contributing to the labor she is not under epidural analgesia she can lift up her own legs and you don't have any help at hand you can ask her to do so if that is not the case then obviously assistance is needed and what do we do we are going to flex the thighs to the abdomen and that is called as the mac roberts maneuver all right so you look here or uh, this is um, showing one side of the image where an assistant is flexing the leg and simultaneously giving the supra pubic pressure there's another assistant who is going to hold the other leg so at least two additional assistants you need to uh, have right so hyperflexion of the maternal thighs and legs towards the abdomen is done what that does it it rotates the pelvic in a kefala direction okay so you can see here the symphysis pubis is also rotated upwards there is straightening of the sacrum straightening of the sacrum with respect to the lumbar spine and look at this look at this how it changes the axis of the birth canal okay because of this change in axis what happens is that the uh, the shoulder that is stuck behind the symphysis pubis dislodges and can 
can deliver all right simultaneously that the supra pubic pressure that the assistant applies that also helps because it adducts the shoulders it adducts the shoulders okay into the oblique diameter of the pelvis oblique diameter is larger than the anterior posterior diameter and therefore help the shoulders to uh, deliver okay so this is about the mech roberts maneuver this is uh, the maneuver that we attempt first okay now what if this maneuver fails we have applied the mech roberts maneuver we are doing the supra pubic pressure uh, supra pubic pressure we have or have not given the episiotomy based upon the need if these measures fails we can go either way we can deliver the posterior arm or we can try the internal rotational maneuvers depending upon the clinical circumstances depending upon which maneuver the obstetrician is more comfortable at so operator experience is also very very important so look here the figure on the left shows us how we deliver the posterior arm and once the posterior arm has delivered okay once we have delivered the posterior arm this di diameter of the shoulders okay so look at this diameter here and look at this when the posterior uh, arm has delivered so once we are able to discover, uh, deliver the posterior arm this diameter this is the uh, shoulder girth let's say that diameter decreases and therefore becomes easier to deliver the rest of the baby so sometimes delivery of the posterior arm can also work and other than that if that doesn't work we can also try the internal rotational maneuvers all the meanwhile we obviously we have to inform the senior obstetrician and the anesthetist because we have to anticipate uh, the complications uh, uh, you know beforehand we have to anticipate that whatever maneuvers we might try we might fail and therefore the help of senior people and anesthetists need to be utilized and even the uh, senior pediatrician needs to be informed okay so let us talk about the internal rotational maneuvers now friends these internal rotational maneuvers are something that one gains by experience all right what i want uh, the uh, undergraduates to remember is the concept behind those maneuvers because that will help you to remember the maneuvers okay so the concept is very simple as you can see here right now the shoulders are in the anterior posterior diameter look at this line here anterior posterior diameter okay the oblique diameter of the pelvis is greater than the anterior posterior diameter so if we are going to adduct the shoulders push the shoulders into the oblique diameter they can come out that is one logic and utilized by the rubens maneuver so look at this the hand is inserted anteriorly and the shoulder anterior shoulder is adducted okay it is adducted into the oblique diameter with the hope that it delivers if that works fine there is another maneuver which is the wood woods cork screw maneuver in the woods cork screw maneuver what is done is the fetus the baby is rotated 180 degrees right and the posterior shoulder will become the anterior shoulder when we are going to rotate the baby okay by doing that what will happen is that the posterior shoulder uh, normally is placed much lower into the uh, birth canal as compared to the anterior shoulder and when the baby is rotated 180 degree the anterior shoulder will come to lie behind uh, and the posterior shoulder will become the anterior shoulder and the dystocia will be relieved so wood score screw maneuver can also be tried okay there are other maneuvers which are described one of them is the shoulder shrug technique this is a new maneuver which has been recommended again it will depend upon whether you are trained in performing this maneuver or not okay the concept is very is similar okay that the diameter of the shoulders need to be lessened okay and the shoulders need to be brought into the oblique diameter of the pelvis so when we shrug when we shrug like this when we shrug the diameter of the shoulders is reduced okay so using that concept people have devised shoulder shrug technique okay so again the 
shoulders the posterior shoulder is grasped as we can see in this figure here the posterior shoulder is grasped and pulled towards the person who is delivering and after that the baby is rotated to bring the shoulders into the oblique diameter facilitating the delivery of the shoulders okay so it is important to remember the names of the maneuvers the important concept in all of the maneuvers which is common is the same right that the diameter of the shoulders need to be reduced okay so the shoulder needs to be adducted and have to be brought into the oblique diameter so all of these maneuvers with certain changes employ the same principle okay now if these maneuvers fail okay so you realize you will realize that the initial maneuvers are the simpler maneuvers as the uh, simpler maneuvers fail we move on to more complex maneuvers more invasive maneuvers okay so still unsuccessful we can try the gaskins maneuver which is all fours maneuver the woman is obviously for this the woman has to be uh, you know not under any kind of anesthesia because she has to hold herself in the all fours uh, position which is the uh, position as we have seen in the figure here and then the delivery of the shoulders is tried there is another maneuver which is the zavanelli maneuver i don't have the picture for that um god forbid one needs to enter into such situations uh, by this time we are probably delivering a dead baby because um, these are very grotesque maneuvers zavanelli maneuver is putting the fetus's head back inside the birth canal and delivering the rest of the baby by cesarean section so again very grotesque maneuver but by the time we have reached this maneuver probably we are dealing with a dead baby symphysiotomy see the obstruction is behind the symphysis pubis so we cut open the symphysis pubic symphysis that is called a symphysiotomy deliberately fracturing the anterior clavicle anterior clavicle can be fractured when you fracture this anterior clavicle shoulders can be adducted more easily so that is one maneuver that can be done and cleidotomy cleidotomy is just taking the scissors and cutting the clavicle so again these are very invasive grotesque maneuvers and um, therefore they come much down in the line but uh, much down in the clinical circumstance and um, normally uh, in routine clinical scenarios we do not really uh, reach these maneuvers we should be comfortably delivering the baby by either make roberts or one of the internal rotational maneuvers like rubens or woods core screw or the shoulder shrug technique uh, because by the time we are reaching these uh, more invasive methods we are probably dealing with a dead baby